So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Steve Kahn. I'm the director of LSST. Uh, I'm not going to say very much. I'll just stand up, there and take, up here and take this opportunity to welcome you all to our annual All Hands meeting in Tucson. Um, this is a very important meeting for us on the project. It's not only a chance for uh, those of us who are working day-to-day -day issues uh, constructing LSST, but also since we've done this as a project community interface meeting over the years. Um, we've had really fairly good attendance from people in the science community uh, that are invested in LSST personally and eager to see its success. And these meetings are always great chances for technical people to interact with scientists and vice versa and build the true community behind this marvelous project. So we have two presentations uh, for this plenary session and hopefully a fair amount of time for discussion. Uh, Victor is gonna start off and take you through some of the technical accomplishments uh, over the last year, which have been many, as you'll see. Um, those of us who've been working on LSST for, I don't know, the better part of our lifetime, <laughs> uh, it's a real transition to go from showing CAD drawings and cartoon diagrams to showing pictures of real hardware. And, and the past year has really exemplified that more than any other period. So there's a lot of stuff. LSST really has lots of components that are fabricated. We're starting to put everything together. It's a very exciting time for the project. Uh, and so Victor will give you a sense of that. Thanks, Steve. For those of you who don't know me, Victor Krabendam, the project manager, and I'm gonna have to get used to these lights. Um, so as Steve said, I, got a, I have a presentation to show you, uh, but first I wanted to do a little bit of introduction to this whole week and this particular meeting. Uh, and uh, once we get through some of the necessary uh, notices, uh, basically, I want to just tell you that for those of us that live here in Tucson, this really is a great time of year to be here. Um, and I know some of you might be thinking that can't possibly be true, but I'm up here with my coat on and it's perfectly comfortable. <laughs> so, but, uh, but, but really take a moment and go through some of these, uh, th these mornings. I know lots of people like to go for a run in the morning, uh, get out in the evening, uh, do that because it's really a spectacular time. But take some precautions um, and just do the right things. The things that you all know about, these notices are also displayed on our uh, displays that are out in the registration desks. So uh, if you see something there that you felt like you had to learn, uh, then we can get to those uh, later. Um, also, before we get too far into this, I wanted to let you know that we do have a great local organizing committee. You can identify them by the color of their badge. Uh, most of us have blue or purple or whatever color that is, uh, and they have an orange uh, identification. They also look a lot like these pictures. <clears throat> so you can find them either by their badge or by their picture, uh, or where they're hanging out, which will be by the registration desks and the various locations. I also want to give a thanks to the group of people that helped really organize the whole event and picking topics and figuring out how to deconflict uh, the various elements and get them uh, onto the schedule. And so you can read through this list as well. And my thanks to uh, all of these people for uh, joining in this process. It's a little bit like sausage making. Um, and in the end, hopefully uh, we've come up with a good structure for everyone to have a good constructive week. Also, uh, the next slide I've just pointed, uh, pointed out here is also the additional committee members that were really part of the community and really took a scientific focus on how we wanted to organize the week. So my thanks to this group as well. So general information. Uh, we've talked about uh, just sort of safety issues uh, hanging out in the desert, but uh, there's a bunch of things for this meeting uh, that we also have uh, organized for you. And in this, the bottom line is, if you need something, go to the registration desk. Uh, they have all kinds of uh, materials, uh, anything that you need for rooms, they will try their best to accommodate. Um, don't take it upon yourself to start reconfiguring rooms, please. Uh, we've had the, we love that ambition, uh, but 
uh, we have a hotel to deal with and we have a structure to the whole thing. So if you need something, you want to reconfigure, you need a different room, something's happening, uh, just let some of the organizers know and find them at the registration desk. That includes IT issues, whatever you've got going on. I should say that we are trying our best to do the remote participation element to this. Uh, we organize this meeting as an all hands meeting. Uh, it focuses on direct participation, focuses on you being here, uh, but we recognize not everybody can come. And so we are trying as our, our best to make it accessible to those that can't make it, um, but that is not always working out. And um, we just uh, hope for your patience if you're uh, listening remotely. T-shirts, you saw them downstairs. If you haven't seen them downstairs, get yourself to the registration desk and the travel desk downstairs. There's uh, T-shirts for people and there's some available to purchase as well. So look at, uh, look at those different locations for uh, some of the help. One of the uh, other aspects to getting started is of course travel. Uh, it's sort of towards the end of the week, you might start thinking about your, your travel home. Erin uh, is here. She's got a nice desk set up. If you have any issues, any, anything you need to talk to her about, uh, she's there and available. Something just happened to my mic. Okay, so let me just go through um, some of the key elements to the whole week, the way, the, the, week, the way we structured it, where you should be in the various times. So you've already gathered the, the breaks are up here on this level, right outside in the, in the main area. Uh, that's where you'll find breakfast. That's where lunch will be again. Uh, each day breaks and um, supposedly every day, all day, we're going to have coffee and tea stations, uh, which is new. And we look forward to that for some of us that are completely addicted to coffee. Um, other, some other things that you should know about this year, we have a hospitality suite. So if you go to the other side of the hotel, up one level above the reception area, there's two rooms over there. One that DM is using as a, as a breakout area, a little hack area. And then there's also a, uh, the Palo Verde room, which is just set up for just uh, some uh, meetings, groups, uh, nice comfy chairs, tables, whatever you need. Uh, you can use that space. Or of course, you've already figured out you can hang out anywhere in the hotel. Last uh, couple of other items on this chart you can also read as well as I can. Hashtag, if you're, if you're uh, tweeting as I'm talking, then there, there's, your, there's your symbol. You can be talking to the other guys and gals in the room. Um, and then presenters. Uh, as we try to work out how to get this remote participation to, to be as fruitful as possible, one of the things you can do as a presenter is upload your materials. So get on the website, get your session, and upload the presentation. Um, my particular presentation is as, I, as we were having a little bit of technical difficulties, but it should be up. Uh, if it's not already, it should be up soon. And so we're trying to make that available, and that's a better way uh, for remote participants to be able to follow along. So uh, a couple of specific items that I should go through for each of the days. Tuesday, uh, take a look, look for the group photo. That's always a, a highlight for us. We like to get a picture of everybody. Um, and uh, we always try to do things to make sure that you come there uh, and participate in that. Things like the bar won't be open until uh, after the photo is taken and everybody has sat there to do that. Uh, bring a, t a LSST t-shirt, uh, whether it's blue or gray or dark blue, whichever one you have, uh, please come in your LSST gear and we'll have a nice photo. Uh, we also have a reception tomorrow uh, that's uh, also up here. Uh, it'll be up in the sort of the deck area um, and uh, look forward to that later on uh, after, the, uh, after the main parts of the day. Wednesday, um, besides the regular agenda, we do have an unconference in the afternoon. Is Lucy on here? can't see if you are. Anyway, um, she saved herself from being put on the spot. Um, you'll see that in the, in the main area that there's a big board that says unconference on it. That's an, a, a board that we're trying to uh, start collecting some topics for tomorrow, for Wednesday night. So uh, if you have such a, uh, a topic in mind, please go ahead and, and make a note of that and put it on the, 
uh, on the bulletin board, and that'll sort of define for us what what, what meetings will take place or what uh, groups we'll be talking about uh, Wednesday afternoon. And then, of course, uh, new this year, an official fashion, is a little trivia event uh, Wednesday after, after the end conference. And then if you haven't uh, heard me talk enough, both Chuck and I are going to try to explain to the public uh, what we're doing here and why we're doing it. And so come on Thursday evening uh, for this uh, particular talk at 7 p.m. will be open to the public. What I ask is if you're interested in engaging with public, then wear your tag, because that will be a, uh, an indication to the general, the general populace that comes in that you might actually have something to tell them, uh, and they might want to engage with you. Uh, we actually do have a format for uh, some, some specific areas to engage with the public as well. But, uh, that's an opportunity for everybody to come, and we'd appreciate uh, your participation in that as well. And so for those of you that have not already started on the big uh, astronomical migration uh, to the north to see the total eclipse and are still here on Friday, uh, we do have uh, some, some to-go lunches by the afternoon, and then we're pretty much starting to shut down. We have rooms, but we don't have necessarily staff to help you. So. That's sort of a quick walk through of the schedule for the week um, and some additional notice uh, about how we're doing plenaries and we have uh, recordings of any of the plenary sessions and we'll try to make those available uh, on the YouTube site um, following the meeting. A couple other things to notice or to note on your schedules. Uh, keep September 14th in mind. Uh, for those of you that listened to us on the sort of all hands telecon we had a couple weeks ago, we broadcast that the 14th is our next day in the life. So if you're not familiar, that is the sort of the day that we post and hope that everywhere across the project, whatever you're doing, whatever your contractors are doing, whatever activity is going on, that we send a photo, a little caption, and uh, send it into the, into the project and we make uh, videos of it. It's a lot of what you see in, um, in some of the footage. Uh, it comes from those, uh, from those uh, submittals, and we really do appreciate just seeing the breadth of all the things going on. So please take a, take a moment on the 14th and, uh, and participate in that activity. Next year, we're already looking for what we plan for this, uh, miss, this meeting, and uh, although we have not contracted for the actual venue, uh, we are looking for August 13th to the 17th to have LSST 2018, uh, which kind of pains me to think that we're already talking 2018, but that's the way it goes. Um, also, communication surveys, all the regular things, if you've participated in these kinds of meetings, the project has already gotten a communication survey. Uh, there's a science survey, I believe. Community survey has also already gone around. So uh, please take a moment and help us out. Fill those in. Give us some feedback. Um, and uh, we do look at those, and we do try to incorporate that feedback into uh, the ways we move forward. Um, I just want to point out one more thing, and that's the digital signage. Um, and morning breakouts, I get, or the morning plenaries, are just an another opportunity. Uh, anything you have that you want to try to help communicate, let, a, let us know at the registration desk. We might make, a, make an announcement at the plenary, or we also have this digital signage. Those displays that you see that are going on around the registration desks, that is our normal digital signage. That's the kind of things that we broadcast uh, to our teams in the various locations. And so look at those um, and um, look for other uh, upbreaking events for even this week uh, to see what might be happening. And I put, a more, I put a reminder in here for soccer. I think Jeff is probably organizing soccer each morning. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. So uh, as i about to transition into a little bit more of what's going on with the project, I do want to point out that uh, this year uh, our patch for 2017 is honoring the networks that are being put in place uh, for between our summit facility and NCSA and the various other locations uh, for uh, distribution of the data. And so that's, what the, that's the basis of the, of the patch. If you have not been associated with this meeting in the past, then you may not be familiar with what the number is. 
I'm not going to tell you what the number is because there's other people in the room that know what it is. I'm imagining that there's a game that can be played here. Um, and, and that's um, sort of a hide and seek, figure out what it means. Uh, so the 266 does have a real value, a real meaning. And um, <laughs> I wasn't supposed to say that. Anyway, uh, thanks to the group that uh, helped us put that patch together. That was uh, a lot of help. OK, so let me just get through a little bit of uh, the project in the last year. Uh, I can't possibly talk to all of the details, so I've just sort of given a random sampling, uh, not that random, um, of the kinds of activities going on. And, and my real hope for this is that I show you a picture, give you a, a make a comment that inspires you to go talk to some people um, that are part of the group that you see being presented. So uh, let me just walk through that. And uh, again, I'll apologize ahead of time for being rather brisk in going through this. So let me start with data management. Uh, they have had a very busy year. Uh, in particular, you know, uh, even from last year and the last 18 months, really, uh, there's been a lot of replanning. That was the big, uh, the big uh, objective. And it's really dominated everything that, we, that, that the team has been doing. And I just want to take the opportunity in front of everybody to thank the whole team, because while we're in the process of replanning and trying to get visions for going forward, uh, the whole team had to stay focused on getting some things done. And so my, my thanks go to the, from everybody that was working on real replanning stuff, but also the, just the team itself. And mostly, I want to thank Mario, who's probably here somewhere, and Yasik, but, and then now Will, as the primary leaders for making that whole, ep that whole effort really come together. Um, and that whole effort uh, really includes not just when you, know, you hear words like replan and you think, well, they just really reschedule. But it's not, it was much more thorough than that. And it stemmed, it was things like just the full objective, the real design. Uh, and, and Mario put a real nice stamp on just sort of the vision for where DM is going. Uh, to meet the requirements. Um, you'll also see that the team got organized in different ways, uh, identifying product owners in a way that we hadn't done previously, and really defining what was going to be built, uh, getting those schedule, getting the deliverables in place and, and, and lining those up to the overall project schedule. We do need for these things to integrate, and they can't just integrate at the very end. And so there's a lot of work done in, in, in getting all those things synced up. Um, and it all culminated in July, just a few weeks ago, the team presented in an agency-led review. Uh, and while we haven't gotten the report yet, the outbriefing was excellent. Uh, they had some good comments to make, but the team uh, did an awesome job presenting the work uh, that they've been doing, and in particular, the plans going forward. And the bottom line is, of course, that there is a, a price tag, uh, there usually is, and uh, you'll, hear, you'll hear some of that replan cost is costing $12 million. Uh, I want to just point out that it's an 8, 9% increase. Uh, so uh, we're a couple years in, uh, three years in at this point, and the team has looked forward and, and said, yeah, we, to replan, to do an estimate to complete, it's another 9% more money. Uh, so it's really re very reasonable, and again, thanks to the team. So I just want to show a couple of things, and this is when I really start to pick it up the pace. Um, you'll see different organization charts with DM. Uh, this will come up again in some of the breakouts, uh, but it really focuses on more detailed on who owns what uh, and who's going to be delivering and how the, how the team is organized. And of course, central, I can't really point to anything, uh, is Will in the center um, as our, our new data management project manager. Also, a lot of emphasis in just understanding where to look for the data uh, and where to look for the information. So the document tree is really key to understanding the whole DM system, whether it's starting with requirements. It's a little bit backwards from how we normally show things because it starts at the bottom and works its way up and out. Uh, so if you, start at the, if you start down here, you see um, sort of the project level documentation and then how DM has has uh, captured that and moved it around uh, to, to not just define its internal requirements, but also to define how they're going to verify and how they're going to test. And so those are also very big parts of, uh, of, of the effort. A lot of work went into what's the design, what's the architecture, 
and really finalizing some of those things. One of the things that we were lacking in the early years is sort of that um, crisp, making it crisp and understanding fully where this was going. And so uh, uh, KT in particular did a lot of effort uh, in this, and you can see LDM 148 is a great place to go to uh, to really see the, the, um, the architecture and, and, the, and how that leads to products. And can't go too far without recognizing that there's a whole bunch of pipelines and catalogs. And then eventually, uh, I'll point out the, the, the term of the science platform. Uh, that is also a, a topic of many of the breakouts. I really invite you to come, as particularly the community, to, to go engage with the DM team and listen more about how the science platform works. That's going to be the, 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 the mode for you to get engaged. It's going to be where the user interfaces are launched from. It's going to be the, the mechanisms for you to get, uh, to get your science done. And of course, it all sits on hardware. And this is my shout out to both Margaret and Don uh, at NCSA for having done an, a, a whole bunch of work in the last year to really define what the hardware, mostly what the services and what this, what's necessary to, to make DM happen. And so there was a lot of work in the replan uh, that, that really was based on, uh, on understanding what, um, what, service, what service has services and databases and things needed to be put in place and managed to make this whole DM system work. And finally, uh, a, a, because we are talking a lot this week about verifications and early integrations, I do want to point out that just a couple weeks, well, it's about a month ago now, that the camera and the DM teams did uh, do an installation at NCSA where there's a DAC now running. And so the camera DAC um, and is now running at NCSA for that early sort of integration and testing to happen. And so that's the kind of thing that we're seeing a lot of right now and really focusing on. So if I shift to the camera team, um, you see that the camera team is, as we've always known, very distributed and working uh, on many fronts in many areas and still building the massive camera that we know, 3.3 gigapixels, and all the elements are sort of blown out here for, 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 for uh, uh, looking at and understanding the various subsystems. And they too have had a very busy year. Uh, lots of things, that, lots of activities happening uh, on the sensor front in particular, uh, culminating in several of the uh, tower rafts being, being completed. And so raft tower modules one and two are done. Each one has a different set of sensors from different vendors. Um, and while there are challenges, uh, for sure, uh, dealing with the production of those sensors, I do want to point out in the bottom right that it's, as you hear about those challenges and you hear about the work being done, 39%, uh, I think 85 sensors, science grade sensors, have been delivered. And so a uh, shout out to the whole camera team, uh, particularly at Brookhaven and Harvard and Slack, uh, for getting those, to getting that, uh, that, pro that productivity and those, and those milestones reached this year. Also, lots of activity with the cryostat. Uh, both the housing has been delivered, but all, maybe more importantly, uh, if you've been paying attention, we did have some issues with the grid, um, and that's all been overcome. Uh, it is a uh, fully functional, fully specced and two, two spec uh, grid. Uh, it's been delivered sitting at Slack um, and ready for the next level of integration. And then uh, what you see on the right, I didn't have a good picture of the refrigeration. I did want to point out that the refrigeration team is uh, very busy uh, working on that aspect of the subsystem and, in, in, and particularly lately, very involved with the telescope team. There's a lot of activity there in how that gets, uh, how that interface works um, and how we support the, the refrigeration system on telescope. And so there's, uh, that work has being, uh, been really accelerating in the last uh, few months. Optics, optics have a way of always being in the, in the news. Um, and the camera optics have not shied from that, um, from that tradition, but they're all working, they're all underway. Um, some of the major problems have been completely overcome. Some of the minor issues are going to be uh, the ways you tell that these are can't tell LSST optics. Uh, we could have stamped them with a number or we could put a feature on them. 
uh, either way uh, that, that helps us to identify uh, our optics from anywhere else in the world in case we needed that. Um, but that's all really going well and Livermore is, web, is very on top of this uh, as well as the, the Slack management and making sure that those optics, which are really uh, very challenging, 1.6 meters in diameter is not a small lens. Uh, and that's, um, that's really moving along at this point. Other hardware that's really progressing, uh, again, just trying to show you some of the pictures of some of the things that, that are going on uh, with shutters that are, this is a gigantic shutter uh, with blades that have to move very quick, very crisply uh, to very well understood timing, and they're big. Um, and so the shutter work, the shutter work is ongoing and making some good progress. Uh, activity out in, in France, uh, had the pleasure of joining one of the manufacturing readiness reviews there for that activity, and they're doing an awesome job building some really great hardware uh, for the filter exchange uh, mechanisms. And then lastly, uh, camera integration. Uh, at Slack, the team is really putting a lot of effort into that aspect. The clean room's in place and starting to get populated working, uh, getting some of the equipment in place for testing these, uh, these various systems and getting ready for full integration. And so that's also a pretty, pretty key activity at the moment. A shift into the telescope team, uh, also very distributed in all the places where all the parts are coming from. Uh, there's just another picture of some of the key elements of the, of the telescope team, uh, with, of course, the summit facility being the prime location. But also in the bottom left, the base facility is also being built, um, which is not a small building. Uh, it's a big office building, but it's also the data center for, um, for La Serena and is a key element to that, uh, to that construction effort. Uh, and then, of course, the, the out-of-focus auxiliary telescope picture uh, on the top right which is also coming together. But really, the best way to understand uh, what's going on with the base for the summit facility is the absolutely horrendous winters we've been having. Um, and so that's not a real person. Don't worry, Chuck. Um, but I thought this was a really interesting picture because it just identifies just how buried the team has been in trying to get progress going with that summit facility amidst uh, really just difficult times. Uh, we, have, we have never lost something like, I think it was 29 days in a row where we couldn't get to the summit. That just doesn't happen. But we, it happened to us. And so uh, as those times are difficult, um, the thumbs up um, is really just an indication that the team just continues to, pro to, to make progress. Um, and if you look really closely, those images um, on the left are just snow-infested building. Uh, the one in the middle just indicates to you how, even though the, the building is starting to look closed up, it's not. And when it snows up there, it, goes, it snows sideways and gets everywhere. And so these are the kind, just an indication of the kind of hard, of the difficulties that the team is facing trying to get this building built. But they are making progress, and it's looking really good. Uh, and the bottom right, of course, is Freddie's latest job. Uh, getting the um, hopefully better focus, a uh, real uh, calibration telescope dome being placed just a, a week ago. So good progress there. Um, also with the dome, lots of parts coming together. Uh, these are images on the left, top and, and left of hardware coming together in Italy uh, and then uh, arriving on the site. And the first activity which you see in the bottom right is sort of the interface and trying to get the, um, the plates in place and aligned for uh, what will be a fairly rapid development after they get the, uh, the initial plates in place. Uh, then you'll start to see some real shape uh, forming over the next uh, probably four or five months. Lots of activity with the mirror cell itself. Um, the upper right is just a uh, rendering of the mirror on the cell. The bottom right is the actual cell. Uh, and so that is a, an activity that's been going on uh, and has been a very um, strong focus, let me say, for not just the, te the uh, telescope team, but also for uh, the whole management team. Uh, because as we'll talk about in a minute, uh, they have overtaken the critical path uh, for the entire project. And so 
Um, the camera got a, camera is no longer a critical path, and it is the development of this system uh, which is. And so the team uh, is busy working lots of parts, uh, trying to get ready for uh, populating that massive cell with all those pieces that uh, are represented there on the right or left. Okay, uh, telescope mount is also coming together. Uh, lots of great activity here as well. Uh, some individual images of various parts on the left, including massive uh, mirror covers, or one quarter of the mirror cover, and some very large, um, well, the name has just escaped me, capacitor banks, thank you, Chuck. Capacitor banks on the left in those orange cabinets. Um, and then, of course, the actual trial assembly that's ongoing in, in one of the uh, fabrication facilities in Spain. And if I just render on top of that, you'll see what the telescope will look like um, in about, I think about the end of November, uh, early December, they should be testing that system, uh, which will look a lot like that, but now it looks like this. So good progress there, lots of things happening. Uh, and then of course there's also uh, optics, other optics for the telescope team and on uh, your left is actual M2 glass in the actual M2 hardware uh, that is uh, looking down, ready to be tested optically. And so uh, that is a big accomplishment there. That system is coming together uh, and is also looking very good. On the right, you see some of the uh, hexapod rotator elements coming together. Uh, those, those parts have all been tested in Colorado and are, um, are have all passed their inspections and, and coming together. So that's a, a subsystem that's also very near its completion. So good, good progress um, on those elements. So let me shift into uh, the education and public outreach. Uh, this team is uh, really starting to form up. And in the last year, uh, we've really added some great, some great team members to making that progress. And you start to see, uh, there's some talks this week uh, from the EPO team, you see a lot of the design starting to form. They've started to get a lot of um, the portals and apps and just sort of the presence that they plan on having uh, in place. And so you start to, it start to start that engagement, start to figure out what's the right way to convey all of this data to, to a public that's really thirsty and ready to get, this, uh, to get the information. They just need the tools to be able to engage with it. And so the EPO system is really focusing on that and really focusing on the evaluation of what it should look like, how it should work, what works good for people. I, I, I took these two slides, and if you have a moment, you can read the, uh, the nice message we got back from one of the evaluators and one of the people that was involved in the evaluation and, and trying to get that engagement, try to figure out what we should be doing uh, to, make that in, to, to make that part of the project as, as successful as possible. So there's some really good activity there. And lastly, let me just uh, focus a little bit on the project office, and in this particular case also the systems engineering group. Um, and this past year, if you had a chance to, to listen in on Chuck's uh, commissioning talk, you already heard that uh, in January, uh, this past January, Chuck had a commissioning review, um, and he has another one coming up in late January, February timeframe that is a key part of what the project is right now. It's part of what Steve was mentioning as why this is a really critical time. We're really starting to shift in where we're looking uh, while the teams are absolutely busy trying to get things done and, uh, and get things built. The project itself and the project engineering really has to be focused on what's coming next and how we make all of this stuff come together and be one system is key. And so this is, uh, because it is fundamentally a different period, we, st we start to have to think about how we organize. So I chose this chart from uh, one, of the one of the commissioning uh, slides, <clears throat> but as just a really a representation as to what we have to be thinking about, not just the actual activities and actual technical things, but really how we, behave, how we are gonna work as a team in getting through that very critical time uh, on the summit and across all the platforms uh, to get the system working. And finally, let me also say that for us, the verification aspect is really a distinctly different part. Uh, it's, it's really an important thing to be focusing on. Uh, it's a very much embedded in what we do in commissioning, uh, but is a separate focus. And we have some specific documentation. Uh, and as we go through uh, the week, you'll see some very specific uh, focus 
that is both on commissioning uh, as activities, but also an, on verification and, and uh, validation. So let me uh, take a moment also to point out that in the last year, our org chart has uh, changed slightly. Uh, and I'll point out a couple of people in the subsystem area in particular that have changed. And of course, I cannot tell if any but if these people are here, but uh, let me start with Will. Is Will here? Will is in the front. He's not gonna stand, but he will, because I just asked him to. Well, thank you, Will. Also joining us is Amanda. Both of them have taken on leads. <laughs> taken on leads of those major subsystems and we really thank you for coming on board and we're really looking forward to having you guys join. Um, I'll take a second also to, because he's sitting in the same row, just fortuitously, Brian. Uh, we've, we've, Brian has been with the project for the last four and a half years, but only a half a year ago took on uh, being systems engineering manager. And so thank you, Brian, for taking on that new step. <clears throat> so I can't go through all of the changes that we've had in the, in the team uh, at the various levels, but uh, if you're new to the project, I welcome you. And uh, particularly if you're new in the last year and haven't been part of this week, uh, we'll really look forward to having you engage with all of your collaborators and, and colleagues here. Uh, and get some introductions done and start to work together uh, and help, uh, help with the collaboration and the communication right here this week. So it wouldn't be a talk of mine if I didn't tell you a couple of numbers. I know they're not of the most interest to all of you, but the bottom line is really very good. Um, and so from the NSF standpoint, uh, we have been treated very well in our funding authorizations. They've been right to plan and we have about 240 million of the 471 uh, already authorized. At this point in time, uh, the NSF side of the house is about 42% complete uh, with an earned value of 167 million. And so we're moving along. If the pictures didn't already tell you, uh, our spend rate should and our accomplishments do. Uh, at this point, we've also, uh, when I wrote this slide, we'd only used about 10 million of the 82 contingency. Um, and that was about 31% of the work remaining, which is a really good posture uh, to be in at, at this point in the game. And we have, uh, if you've listened to, if you've been paying attention in the past, we used to say we had 13 months of schedule contingency before we started uh, full up operations. Uh, we have changed our schedule. I mentioned earlier that the telescope team took over the critical path and in doing so we needed to allocate a couple of months of schedule and so we are, our contingency has gone from 13 months to 11 and I'll show you a couple of graphics of that in a moment. But before I do that, let me just show you, uh, a, it's a painful plot and I won't go into all the details, uh, but this is our contingency usage. So when I made the chart, we were in the red and had only used 9.9 .9 million. But let me tell you that one of the reasons why our upcoming status review has the focus that it does is because in the last month, We've, out, we've already used up another $6 million in contingency. And I also mentioned earlier that the DM replan wants another 12. And so uh, that's what that, that graph is, trying to, is, is starting to represent, is that not just how, what we've actually already allocated, but what we're planning or know we're about to allocate is starting to um, use a significant amount of contingency. The good news is, is that it stays all within that blue boundary. And so that's where we thought we would be using contingency. And so it's not horrible. It's not, not, not a drastic amount different from what we had planned. Um, but it's still a, a significant amount of, uh, of, of sudden use of contingency that we're, uh, we're about to use. That's what, uh, and I only focus on it in this audience just to let you know that the project team members that are here are also really focused a lot on our next status review up, coming up in, in early September. And one of, those, one of the reasons why it's so important is because of our uh, because of some of the risks and some of the changes that have been made in the last uh, last couple of months. The DOE project is also in equally uh, good standing, uh, although they're starting to use their contingency as well, um, and at, uh, have have out mostly authorized all of their money, and so the DOE is 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 um, following the authorization plan as well. Uh, the camera is about 68 percent, 67 8 percent complete. Uh, having earned about $102 million of value. Uh, their contingency 
usage has been um, a little bit more robust than ours, uh, but they're farther along, and they have about 22% remaining on, on, on remaining work. Uh, there's some estimates to complete that uh, identify using uh, a little bit more of that, uh, but I would say I would characterize it as um, a project that is, work, that is working well and in, in reasonable shape um, with the accomplishments and risk, uh, risks going forward. So I mentioned contingency at one point uh, earlier. Let me just show you it graphically, uh, and then uh, we'll switch over to some other topics. Uh, but here's how it looks from our, our general standpoint. And, and since this is a little bit new uh, in the last year, let me just point out that uh, if we just focus on the right-hand side, you can see that the data management is the upper, hand, upper uh, chart or upper line, followed by the telescope and site development. And the red line, I clearly identifying that the telescope and site now owns the critical path, running into what is here early commissioning activities, later going into final uh, system integration and then science verification as the end commissioning aspects, leading to our operational readiness review or early start of, of operations or full, the, the earliest opportunity for the start of the survey. And that gives us 11 months before the planned start of uh, operations. And so that's just a, that representation. And in the past, this would have been 13 months, uh, and, the and the telescope team had a little bit of float, uh, but now that float, it belongs to uh, the camera. So that's just a way to, uh, to take a look at that. And really, the focus of this meeting, again, is to thinking, uh, thinking a lot about how we get through that commissioning page phase. And so this is just sort of a highlight of that end game. If you, this is just exactly the same as the previous chart, really focusing on everything leading up um, to the start of the system-wide commissioning is just getting those subsystems in a place where we can, we can support that uh, and get into the full integration verification phase. Um, and then one of the things that is also new uh, in as we fully develop the, the schedules and the plans, we ha start to see things like uh, there is a transition off of construction that is also going to blend into operations in the same way that, op that operations, uh, you can't see on this element in this chart, but in this one you can, that operations has a ramp up. Uh, we will also start to talk uh, about how we ramp down and have and how we really do that handshake in a way that's most productive um, and efficient. And so you can start to see some of those elements start to appear in, in the way we show the, 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 the plan. Okay. Um, so at this point in time, I would say this is a picture from last year uh, of all of our participants, but it's as good as any to just to re reiterate to you that we as a project and an organizing committee have really done what we can to sort of set up this week. And now it's up to uh, all of our participants to get engaged and make this, a produ make this as productive as possible. Uh, and so I really encourage you all to communicate, collaborate, and um, get the, make this as efficient as possible. So now we're gonna do what we're never supposed to try to do. But if this doesn't work, you can look at the hashtag that Mario sent around, because it's his video. Thank you, Mario. But it's... It's a fun way for us to transition.
Can we reimburse Mario for the five dollars he had to spend to do that? Is that within our um, policy? Okay, super. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Ian. Great. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Victor, for that excellent overview of, uh, of where we are on the project. And so, as Victor said, a focus uh, in particular of the project focus part of this uh, week's workshop is on looking towards the end game, verification, validation, and preparing for commissioning. And um, the community workshop is sharing this theme in, in common, really, getting ready for LSST data. And there's a few different ways um, that we're playing off of the theme of getting ready for commissioning and getting ready for LSST data. Um, you'll notice that there's a number of commissioning-focused breakouts that are appropriate both for project and community participation. In particular, Chris Walter and some others are leading a session on uh, commissioning simulations to prepare for commissioning. Uh, somewhat confusingly, there's another set of breakouts with the words commissioning and simulation in the title as well. But this is a really cool concept that Will, uh, Chuck, and I believe Keith Bechtel have been developing that Will Mullane has done before, which is actually simulating the commissioning process itself. Uh, so that should be pretty, uh, pretty exciting and fun to participate in. Uh, on the community side of the house, we have two additional main themes. One is on the continuing development of the observing strategy and the engagement of the community in that ongoing development. And the other is a related topic of uh, the project community interface. Uh, and I'll say uh, a lot more about that for the rest of this talk. Of course, project and community members are welcome to go to and participate in any of the breakout sessions, but these are the themes that I think will resonate most with uh, the community and also across uh, the boundary between the project and community. I also want to draw uh, breakout leads' attention to the fact that the Friday morning plenary is going to uh, be a wrap-up and also an opportunity uh, that should say breakout report back. <laughs> uh, report backs from breakouts. So each breakout lead should be sure that there's somebody in your session that's taking some notes and will be present on Friday morning to give just a minute or two out brief on what were the key outcomes uh, from that breakout session and whether there's any more activities that are going to be uh, building on the results of that session. Uh, the plenaries in the next three days, I also want to take this chance to highlight uh, because they really uh, were chosen to frame uh, around some of these focus topics that Victor and I have highlighted. Tomorrow morning, Jason Kalarai from the Space Telescope Science Institute will give us a presentation on uh, the WFIRST LSST connection. Uh, Angelko Avezic, our project scientist, will give a presentation on uh, plans for setting observing strategies and cadence optimizations. And that'll set the stage for a number of breakouts this week, uh, building on that topic. Wednesday morning's plenary is about the hidden heroes of LSST. It'll be a set of lightning talks, a real cross-section of contributions from all across the project. Uh, we'll get a chance to see uh, what team members uh, at many different sites, both uh, in the US and in Chile, are doing to help build LSST. And I'm especially excited for this session um, because it's uh, always very energizing to hear about what our team members are doing. And we don't often get the luxury um, to, to hear from the folks who are doing a lot of the lifting. Uh, then on Thursday, uh, Brian Selby and Chuck Claver are going to be leading a plenary on verification, validation, and commissioning, and why these things are important. And a, brief, a set of brief talks will be complemented by a panel discussion at the end of that plenary. So before I hop into my slides that'll focus on this uh, project community interface, uh, I want to just give some guidelines for engagement at the breakouts as we look ahead to the week uh, when, we ha when we'll have these working sessions. And breakout leads re received feedback from their points of contact that we're really hoping for there to be a lot of opportunity for discussion versus you know, giving a canned presentations at these breakouts. And so to get the most out of these discussions, uh, I have a set of guidelines that you can think about um, folding in to your style of doing business. And so one is that all of us are here. We want to aim for rigor and excellence in what we do and preparing for LSST and building LSST. And in order to achieve the goals of uh, having rigorous and excellent interactions and getting what we want out of the breakout sessions, we want people to be interactive. People should ask questions. Junior people in the audience who've never been at an LSST meeting before shouldn't feel like um, you shouldn't ask questions. So we want to create a collaborative and inclusive environment so everybody feels free to share the space in the breakouts. 
uh, during breakouts, whether you're a lead or whether you're just somebody participating in the room, we can be aware of our surroundings and encourage quieter members of the group to speak up and to contribute when there's an opportunity for contributions. Something that, uh, that I like that I, I actually got from, I'm not sure what the center's called now, it used to be called the Recurse Center. It was a programmer school in New York City that had rules of engagement uh, for making an inclusive uh, coding environment. And we can all check ourselves, and I think I checked myself, and I uh, violated this at least once today. Pay attention to small social rules. You know, don't say, oh, you know, well actually, stack shouldn't be capitalized, or actually I don't even know if it should be capitalized or not. Or, <laughs> No feigning surprise. Oh, uh, you don't have a Slack account, really? Uh, just you know, try to stick factually with things and help each other when uh, folks aren't as familiar as you are with some of the, the technical framework of LSST. Uh, it's great if we all get in the habit of saying our names before we add questions or comments during plenaries and breakouts. Um, and as always, uh, and as Daniel, Victor, and many others on the project say, uh, please be kind to yourself. Please be kind to others. A lot of people in this room, in the project and community, have a lot going on, uh, both personally and professionally right now. And so we should all be kind to ourselves and acknowledge that that's okay, uh, that we're humans too, in addition to people who are building and supporting uh, one of the greatest science experiments that has ever been built. So uh, on that note, on to the project community interface. So my goals for this talk. Um, I want us to take a moment to recognize, uh, to re-emphasize the mutual benefits of a well-defined project and science community communications framework. I'd also like to introduce some emerging project and subsystem level efforts to strengthen our communications framework with the community. And when I say project, I mean at the project office level, overarching, looking after the communication interests of all of our stakeholders, both internal and external. And when I say subsystem, I mean you know, data management, education and public outreach, systems engineering. These are the pillars um, that are building LSST, that are holding up our, our project. I want to seed discussion for tomorrow morning's breakout on this topic, and also encourage science community members to fill out the survey that was sent via email uh, last Friday. And I'll say more about that in a few. Okay, so healthy communication between the project and community is more important than ever. And as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. Yeah, I almost got that wrong. A picture is worth a thousand words. And my jaw dropped when I saw this picture of LSST uh, just a couple of weeks ago, taken from the SOAR telescope, uh, you know, admiring how the dome is getting put on the Talibration telescope. And it made it feel very real. You know, I had a physical reaction in seeing how close that building is to being complete, uh, even though as Victor showed, <laughs> There's also snow inside the building uh, and other adventures going on um, that we need to, to tackle before that building will be complete. So to be a little bit more specific, right, communication for LSST is ramping up for very good reason. Right? We're only about three years away from first light, as you know, is uh, uh, symbolized or reflected in the fact that there are many sessions on commissioning at this meeting. Precursor experiments, uh, for example, the Zwicky Transient Facility, a time domain survey, are imminent. I think Monsi uh, Koslowal told me this morning that first light for its ETF is September 6th, and they'll have a several month commissioning period and then begin survey operations, um, I think maybe the, the very end of this calendar year, or the beginning of the next calendar year. And there's mutually beneficial preparatory work for these things that are being done both by community members and by the project team. And a question has come up from all sides, which is how can we best benefit from each other's expertise and efforts? And in particular, see the upcoming sessions on the observing strategy. The project is looking to the community for input on the observing strategy, commissioning, I already said, on deblending, on PSF estimation, and many other cross-cutting sessions here with interest um, by the project and the community are showing us examples of how we can mutually benefit from each other. And so in this context, a number of questions and issues have you know, come across many of our desks over the last year via both direct interactions with the science community and also through our science advisory committee, who we uh, talked to this morning uh, about, about these sorts of questions. And I highlight just a few of them here, uh, that you know, different science stakeholders have very different types of communication needs. For example, uh, members of the Dark Energy Science Collaboration, many of them are super users who are trying to run the stack at scale. 
We also have many science community members who just want to know, how can I ask a question on community, or where can I get information on the website, or are there any simulations of LSST's observing strategy that I can use? And we need as a project to make sure that we're uh, getting what we collectively need out of interactions with the broad range of our science community. We've heard that the science information on the website is not that up to date. It's been a while since it's been refreshed. Uh, and then it could be hard to find information even if it's on there. We've heard from folks that there's a lack of clarity for how to communicate, and there's a perception at least of there being too many communication channels. And then another question that's come up for discussion, uh, particularly among folks that are, are more involved with uh, interest in running our software, is what level of community engagement can or should we expect from the project? And you know, the project members asking themselves, well, what level of community engagement is the right fit for accomplishing our needs on the construction project? And I feel good that we have an emerging framework um, that answers both of these questions. And so I think there's a few different reasons why we are now converging on a healthy framework for these interactions. Uh, one of them is just that now's really the right time to make sure we're having these conversations as we're getting closer to commissioning. As Victor highlighted, we have a new head of education and public outreach, Amanda Bauer, and a new project manager for data management, Willem Elaine, who have both themselves um, started to work with strengthening the frameworks within their own subsystems. Uh, and as I'll highlight in a little while, Mario Urich has led the data management system science team in strengthening that framework. And so the five bullet points on this slide here are the list of topics that I'll just gloss over at a high level for roughly the next 10 slides, the rest of my talk. And then tomorrow at the breakout session will be the opportunity for us to dive in a little bit deeper to discuss these topics and for us to have a conversation about where we're going with this. So I've already talked about this topic uh, as a focus of our workshop. We circulated this survey. We've embarked on some website updates. Uh, and then I'll, I'll highlight uh, some progress there and then present just one slide on EPO and a couple of slides on data management and their emerging framework for community interactions. So um, I have this slide in here to remind me that in addition to this plenary talk and our breakout discussion tomorrow morning, we discussed uh, these slides, an expanded version of them, with our Science Advisory Committee meeting this morning to also get their input and feedback on our, uh, the approaches we're taking to engage with the community. As I mentioned on Friday of last week, uh, we circulated actually two surveys, as Victor mentioned. One was a project communication and culture survey, and this is the third year that we've done that, and we've sent that out to our project email exploder. We also sent this science community communication survey out only to our science community email exploder. And so that should have gone to everyone who's a member of a science collaboration and anyone who's gone to our website to opt in to getting emails on the science exploder email list. Um, take a look in your uh, trash if you don't remember getting it. I heard from a few people at lunch that they actually received both of the surveys and assumed the second was a duplicate of the first, so they promptly deleted it. <laughs> and we'll also send a reminder email out uh, so people have access. I believe uh, Suzanne Jacoby was going to post this on community.lsst.org. The irony is that any communication channel you use, you may then potentially bias your answers by people who prefer that specific <laughs> communication channel. So we'll try to uh, disseminate the survey a few more ways before the deadline for participation of Friday the 25th. And so in the next few slides, I just highlight some very early responses from the community. Uh, as of six this morning, we had 21 responses. We've had a few more since then. And I highlight uh, these early answers. One, just to show you the sorts of things that we're trying to learn as a project from the survey. Another, if you look and think, my goodness, how can this be what the results are coming in? It will inspire you even more uh, to reply. Okay, so one, one thing that we were trying to get at is what sort of information does the community want more engagement on or the project to push more information uh, out on? And uh, we listed as choices. I think nobody actually wrote in uh, an optional other category. We wrote down these uh, approximately eight different types. Far and away, general project information was the thing that folks most wanted to hear about. Um, unsurprisingly, observing strategy and science pipelines and algorithms uh, were coming in uh, second. And so, I think I went about two. Um, and you can imagine that after we get substantially more results, 
uh, the communications team and scientists on the project will use these to help us set priorities uh, for our communication. We also tried to understand where people are getting most of their communication from. Uh, for example, it came up in communications meetings. Folks are writing these blog posts um, on a you know, weekly or every other weekly basis. Is anybody reading them? Well, not really in the science community, at least not among these early responders. And people tend to really prefer uh, tried and true methods of communication, uh, such as emails and professional meetings. Uh, although from a project's perspective, we are preferring communication through some of these other channels, so we'll need to figure out how to make that uh, easier or more clear to community members if that's what we continue uh, to prefer. And again, we can discuss at the breakout what that could look like. And then uh, the third question that we really wanted to go for isn't just where does the community go to get information, what if you want to actually interact and have a two-way information exchange with the project? How do you ask questions? How do you raise new ideas? Um, what's your preferred method of doing this? And again, via email, via professional meetings, those tried and true methods are what the early responders at least had as their go-to communication channels. And you know, as we discussed this morning, right now, there's really just a small number of communication channels that the project must respond to, we must react to. And so as a community member, I think that it would be very empowering to think, well, I know if I go through this particular channel, I know the project needs to reply. And so the Science Advisory Committee is a formal avenue, the formal avenue, to get issues raised to the project. If the SAC asks us to look into something, we need to look into it and address it and respond to the SAC's feedback. Uh, another avenue that we've been engaging with the collaborations, which uh, I've been enthusiastic about, and uh, Jelko has led the charge on this as the chair of our project science team, is that once every one to two months, the chairs of the science collaborations have been meeting with the project science team and bringing questions and issues they would like to hear more about to the PST. And I think that's been going very well. And I'll show you in a moment where we've presented these presentations that have taken place between the PST and the science collaboration chairs. And then the one other uh, avenue written here in bold is the Observing Strategy white paper, which a lot of people in the room have invested a lot of volunteer effort on, uh, and which Phil Marshall got posted to the archive today and should appear in the archive today. So I'm setting this down because I didn't clip it to my body. I want to give a round of applause to everyone in the room that worked their butt off. This was a year and a half long project. And, uh, and Zielko, as our project scientist, formally reviewed the results of this community study as presented in this white paper. And, and before I move on, I'll also highlight community.lsst.org, which is one of our preferred methods of communication because it provides an archived Stack Overflow-like Googleable, searchable um, set of answers to community and project questions. So something we're discussing internally, and we can talk about tomorrow with the breakout, is how to make it obvious, what kind of category should be set up? Can we be tagging certain folks to respond to certain questions and issues that are raised on community? I'll highlight a few of these uh, minor updates to the website. Uh, I've taken a little snapshot here of, uh, basically, if you go to the website and click on For Scientists, there's a set of direct links to information, which now includes deep drilling fields and the white papers, and the filter response curves that are available on GitHub. In addition to these uh, new pages that are linked, when you go to For Scientists, previously there had been this you know, overarching language, LSST will do cosmology and dark energy, and here's the four science pillars that LSST was built on. Now it goes straight to a high-level description of the project science team, uh, science collaboration chair interactions, and links to the presentations that have been given so far. And as pres more presentations are given, they'll be linked here, a couple of these interactions between the PST and the science chairs have actually been recorded on BlueJeans, and those uh, links to those recordings uh, will get added as this page continues to get updated. And uh, Amanda Bauer's presentation on EPO uh, happens to be the most recent presentation, and so that's why that appears there uh, in the screenshot. So one thing Amanda has done is uh, during her, just I think it's four or five months, so it's just, I can't believe both you and Will are uh, only a part of the team for four or five months. I know cursor is misspelled. Um, is is to, do, to develop a framework for interacting with the community, to get feedback from the community, to leverage the effort that some members of the community would like to contribute to EPO during construction. 
And she's written down a really nice set of activities here and examples of ways that the community can contribute and engage with EPO uh, during construction. Um, I believe Amanda's leading a community, uh, not community, I've said the word community, it should be like a bingo card. Uh, citizen science projects break out tomorrow morning for community members that are interested to learn more about how to develop and deploy citizen science projects in the era of LSST. Uh, and I'll also highlight here the, uh, the final bullet point, which I especially like, where Amanda encourages uh, the science commun community to seek out communications, diversity, equity, and inclusion training to strengthen their ability to communicate skillfully and sensitively with underrepresented groups. Right, looking ahead to the era of LSST, um, the, the demographics of, of the US are increasingly diverse, right? That's just a fact. Fewer than half of the babies born in the last few years were you know, uh, identified as Caucasian. We live in a diverse world, we live in a diverse country. So being a successful communicator and somebody who trains the next generation of a technically skilled workforce will need to prepare themselves uh, to communicate uh, with, a, with a diverse uh, community. Uh, Mario also presented a quite nice presentation this morning to the SAC and highlighted um, DM's approach to community engagement, which I distill here to just a couple of slides. And again, we'll leave room in the breakout tomorrow to discuss more. And so Mario presented this sort of uh, you know, three-phase vision or three-phase way of thinking about DM's development where number two is you've got to design and build a system that's going to deliver to requirements and wrapped up in there is understanding what you need to do, what data products you need, what form they have to be in to meet your science requirements. And then after you've built, or once you're uh, partway through building the system, to engage with the community uh, to get feedback on it to make sure you're on the right track. And this philosophy has informed some of DM's engagement with the community for quite some time now. Their presence at community workshops, uh, going to desk meetings. I think Mario just gave a presentation to the Solar System Science Collaboration last week. And you know, looking forward, Mario's strengthening this framework and seeing his system science team, which is representatives from the science leadership of all of data management's geographically distributed teams, and seeing that as really the interface between the science stakeholders and the DM engineering team who's building the code, building the pipelines and algorithms. Um, I should say that the primary points of contact between our, the system science team and the stakeholders is still under development and the overall framework is still being refined. And we can discuss uh, primary examples of primary modes of communication and channels of communication and what Mario's ideas are for these points of contact and means of engagement at the breakout. And so the summary slide uh, is exactly the same as the goal slide, um, but just rephrased. And so in summary, a well-defined framework for communication and interfacing between the project and the community is mutually beneficial. Uh, LSST is therefore strengthening our framework uh, for community engagement with input from the community. We're here this week discussing this topic. There will be a breakout to discuss these topics tomorrow, and please fill out the communication survey. And that's all I have. So I think, Victor, are we going to all, are we going to do this now? <laughs> Okay, great. So, uh, so now Steve and Victor and I will all happily take any questions on anything, uh, either that we brought up at this plenary, or anything else you want to ask us questions about. And they will do that. Thank you. <laughs> and there's microphones here that uh, Ian are going to pull up a little bit. So you can just walk up to a microphone if you'd like to ask a question. Well, I'll just unclick in case that I can always hand it to Steve. Okay. I'll stand over near Steve and we can share this one. Surely there must be some questions. There's ways you can like to get off the phone. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, based on what you just said, I wanted to warn against mistaking frequency of use with preference of use, because that assumes that the same information is available through all the channels, which it isn't currently. No, 
Thank you very much. That's an excellent point. And that's. He's supposed to have 10 of them, so. Oh, yeah, sorry. See, I break all my rules. Um, <laughs> thank you for asking that question. Could you please uh, uh, share your name with the audience? Uh, Pins Hallert. I'm working at Princeton. Okay, great, thank you very much. And uh, one challenge that we had when building the survey was getting, um, getting a level of nuance more than comes across to those basic questions. And so that's a great point, and one that I hope, uh, and I'm actually confident, uh, the community will bring some more um, insight into at the breakout discussion. Okay. Thank you. Yes, uh, Kevin please. Real, I work at Slack. My question is, um, it's not really diversity and inclusion, communication. Um, one of the things that I've struggled with uh, at Slack is having human resources actually make that happen, actually provide said training, actually come up with a policy, actually come up. LSST has been better than um, the average on that, I think. but. Uh, when and how will that actually happen? Training for how to be better at what we ought to be better at. Uh, great, thank you, Kevin. I'll say a few words and then I'll uh, turn to Victor and Steve, um, or maybe even uh, Suzanne or Chris and see if they'd like to add. So there's a few different ways, uh, at least that I think about the need for diversity and inclusion training. And some of it is, is the HR bread and butter, which is things like how do you run your searches to try to recruit a diverse workforce? But then, right, it doesn't really mean much to have a diverse workforce if there's not an inclusive workplace environment for them to feel welcomed in and to you know, fully thrive. So on the you know, HR front, um, there's the standard practice to teach people about um, unconscious bias uh, when reviewing applications. There's attention paid to the composition of the search committees. There's been increasing attention paid at least for the Aura ad. So when I'm talking about HR, I'm talking about Aura HR. It should be clear, we have team members working for many different institutions. There's been increasing attention paid to the wording in ads because it's well known that, for example, certain types of language are less appealing uh, to a diverse set of applicants. For example, job ads that are um, very comprehensive and listing a large number of absolute requirements that maybe when you really think about it, having 10 years of you know, executive level data management leadership experience isn't necessary, um, or maybe being uh, an expert in seven coding language wasn't actually necessary. Those are extreme examples, but we take very careful looks at, at, um, at the wording for the job ads. In terms of training, we don't have a comprehensive training program, but we have started to implement a limited set of things along these lines. And so one relatively more legalistic thing is the handbook for how to follow up on um, issues of bullying and harassment in the workplace that Daniel Calabrese, our business manager, led the drafting of a year ago. We have an ombudsperson program uh, implemented which uh, people can bring issues that they find in the workplace to and that's been a very nice complement to an HR process for bringing up issues of workplace culture because you know, we have, because we have team members from many different sites, even if there's um, a, an issue with workplace culture between two or more individuals, HR is not necessarily the right place to go if the individuals all work for different institutions. Um, HR has worked to make a training uh, an aura training on uh, bullying and harassment as well, and that's going to be rolled out soon. And one thing we've been working with HR on is whatever training they require the aura staff to take, we want it to be uh, applicable and offered to everyone who works for LSST. And uh, following up on aura HR's efforts, Daniel Calabrese, Chris Montgomery, me, and some others have talked about what sorts of um, training session could Chris, our training coordinator, can you wave hi, Chris? Hi, Chris. Um, you know, he's been very proactive in thinking about what can he do to augment our online training program. Uh, we have brainstormed things like a brown bag lunch series for people who are interested to discuss specific topical things, such as stereotype threat and unconscious bias. Um, but we haven't pushed through and implemented it yet. So there's, there's a lot of things that we've been talking about implementing. 
but we don't have a formal diversity inclusion training. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, I'll just add a couple of personal comments on this. So um, I certainly agree with everything Beth said, but those of you who go back a number of years with LSST and attended meetings like this may have noticed that they were decidedly less diverse in the early years. In fact, it was um, quite a remarkable element of the impression that LSST, the LSST project gave in the community as being an environment that was not especially re receptive to diversity. And we're, f we're a long ways from having completely cured that problem, but I think things have improved substantially. And they've improved because we just took notice of it. I think that's the most important thing, is to just pay attention to diversity. Um, there are training things, there are ways to fight hidden bias, as Beth indicated, and we have incorporated those um, at all of our major institutions. Um, it's a somewhat slow process, and we're never going to get everybody on the same page on these issues. But I think, you know, the main thing is for people just to be aware of it and pay attention to it, and the situation does improve. And the other thing which I, I really liked about your presentation, Beth, was this emphasis on ways to communicate. Um, I myself have learned that, you know, different people hear very different things from what you say uh, based on their environment, based on where they come from, based on their age, based on all kinds of things. And uh, the more we have gatherings like this, I think it becomes apparent that um, Different kinds of comments can be interpreted lots of different ways, and just paying attention to that, um, I believe, will, will help with, with diversity and inclusion to a large degree. The one thing we need more in this project is people who are willing to get up to the microphone and ask questions. <laughs> Pat Burke at Stanford. Uh, this question is um, partly, you know, we're hearing a lot about the, the bad winter and also that uh, GPI at Gemini has been having very bad seeing. So could you talk about, um, so the seeing distributions that we have, the uh, PSF, the atmospheric seeing, that we use for our models and, you know, the science that we can do in a 10-year survey, uh, and also the OPSIM uh, assumptions about weather patterns, et cetera. Uh, what were those based on in terms of how much time, uh, a time interval, and has that been, what level of tracking do we have since then? Uh, and so do we have enough data that we could actually put some uncertainties on those and some ranges uh, in trying to consider what 10 years science is actually going to give us in terms of statistical uncertainties? Thanks, Pat. Um, I don't know that I know the specific answer for exactly how long. Uh, the original data that we used was decades of, of data from Tololo and about a decade of data from Pachon was all incorporated into the original models. I will invite Chuck or Chuck is coming to the podium as if he wants to answer that question. I'll just stay here at the microphone. There you go. <laughs> Okay, uh, so specifics, right? So the weather pattern that OPSIM uses now was based on actuals from uh, CTIO Sarah Pachon from the years 1975 to 2005, something like that. Um, a pretty long baseline. Um, we know that uh, the weather patterns are changing. Um, we uh, we should you know look at the the current weather pattern to know whether those statistics still hold up and what the trends look like. But at least in that data set, we did look at trends. And we, we, there were some, but nothing super obvious. And then as far as the seeing profile uh, that we use and have been using to model the system, that was primarily based on on-site DIM measurements at the LSST site. And I believe it was something Jacques, uh, where's Jacques? It was like a three or four year baseline uh, for those measurements. 
But then as soon as we did that early leveling of the summit site, we had to take those, that equipment down off the, the site. And um, you know, the plan right now is to try to get um, uh, th that equipment back on site as soon as it's feasible uh, to start reestablishing a new baseline for the as-cut site with the building on it, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I'm not sure what the, the schedule is for that um, in the telescope and site plan, but it is part of the plan is to get that equipment on site as soon as we can. Yeah. So uh, you saw the picture where we're looking at the calibration uh, dome going on the calibration building. That's where we're going to put the uh, the dim. Uh, next week we're going to we are planning to build a tower and a dim like we had during uh, site selection, and that is supposed to happen beginning of next year. So that's when we're going to start having some data coming in. If there's no one else, uh, Pim Schaert, still at Princeton. Um, so as I, we heard about our precursor experiments, um, but um, what are our competitors? Do we have any, and if so, on what front are? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a, a true statement. In fact, we have a number of uh, of representatives from our international contributors here at this meeting, and there'll be a reception for them tonight. And I think, uh, you know, we haven't gotten as fully, uh, as much reach in the international community as we hope, but we did get a lot. And the reason is LSST is world unique. There's, there really, there are other surveys, as you know, that address some things, but there's nothing else that anybody else in the world is even planning that really covers the range of LSST science. So it's nice to be unique. <laughs> and I think it has, um, it has been responsible for a lot of the federal sport we've got as well as the international sport. And, and I'll add to my sort of cheeky answer and say actually, the next decade is just gonna be a thrilling wild ride for astrophysics, right? As Steve said, there's nothing that's competing with LSST for LSST science and the way LSST is doing it. But there's a lot of extraordinary things on the horizon. Uh, you know, we'll hear tomorrow about W first from Jason Calari. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll leave it at that because then I'll inevitably leave something off. It's exciting and wonderful. But it's going to be an exciting wild ride for the next decade. Michael, uh, Michael Strauss from Princeton. I just want to ask, uh, what role does the LSST community have in planning for the 20, 2020 Decadal Survey? What should we be thinking about? I'll, I'll take that. So, uh, yeah, the, the Decadal Survey process is just beginning, and a number of us are starting to pay attention to it. Um, almost certainly, um, it will be an item of interest in that survey is what are we gonna do with LSST after the 10 years? And so there have been a number of informal responses to that question. Um, several of us, Chris Stubbs, myself, some others have given talks about ideas about what we might do with LSST after 10 years and how viable are those. But that's, that's a topic that I think we owe the community a reasoned um, synopsis of. Uh, and it's both a scientific and a technical question because some of the ideas you can imagine of replacing the camera with something else, there are technical constraints on that. And uh, nobody else in the community is as familiar with those constraints as we are. So it is, um, it is our intention to convene some kind of uh, group within the project and community that will at least address that question. Uh, other elements which are relevant, of course, are follow-up capability for LSST science. Um, Beth co-chaired a very important workshop a year or so ago um, on this topic that has been influential in um, leading people's thinking about not only how to use existing facilities, but what new facilities might need to be constructed to ensure that LSST science is optimized. 
that's another area where I think the LSSD community will be, uh, will be questioned and have input. So those are the two main things, I think. But, you know, the survey, the, the decadal survey is meant to um, include as much of the community as possible. So I think most of you in the room will, in one way or another, be involved in it. Uh, and um, and we'll have your own opinions about what sorts of topics are important for that process. Is maybe I'll invite if Adam Bolton is Adam Bolton in the room? I was gonna he if he is. He had to go earlier. Okay. Uh, is Keith on the SOC? I was just gonna invite someone to say a word about the Snowpack uh, conference in the spring. Uh, if someone from the organizing committee happens to be here. Anyway, there's a uh, there's a conference in the middle of March of 2018. Kyle Dawson from Utah and Adam Bolton, who is the lead of the community a data science center at NOAO, or the co-chairs. And then there's broad representation um, from you know, surveys and other observatories, including LSST. And it's intended to be a, a precursor uh, workshop to, to discuss issues and to do some planning for uh, potentially identifying white papers to go into the decadal survey. And the focus is really on large surveys in the coming decade uh, in big data. Yeah, and, and just for completeness, I should mention that the, the DOE, Office of Energy Physics, has a parallel process to this, which is called Cosmic Visions, or sort of mapping the future of Cosmic Visions. There are various sub-panels on that. But there's one in particular dedicated to optical surveys, and is really sort of addressing the question, what, what beyond LSST and DESI might be necessary to capitalize on dark energy and other fundamental physics questions. So all those things are coming together. There's a fair amount of overlap between the participants in these different venues, uh, and that'll all come together over the next year or so. Uh, hi, John Perico from uh, UW-Washington uh, um, Data Management. Uh, there were some comments earlier during one of the talks about LSST leaving its stamp on the optics, and I'm wondering if you could clarify that a little bit. Is that something that, seriously, is that something that we in DM are going to have to start thinking about in terms of modeling, or is it better than expected? Some of it matters to some of us. So, uh, in all seriousness, I, let me just say that any of the features that we uh, have to deal with whether they're in sensors or optics or anywhere along the way, uh, we definitely evaluate them and do the scientific evaluation uh, just to make sure that any of those features uh, can be dealt with both scientifically and by the DM team itself because we understand that much of those features have to be pulled out by them. So that's sort of the general answer uh, that should put some of this to rest uh, and to make sure that we do follow that process. Uh, but then uh, it is true, uh, I mean, I made a, a bit of a lighthearted uh, attempt at it, but there are features that are developing in, those, uh, in much, of the, um, much of the optical train that we are constantly evaluating and, and have to evaluate, whether it's a divot uh, in glass or whether it's uh, a feature in uh, baffles or it's a feature on our primary mirror. Uh, and these are all things that we have to deal with. Um, and. I can't comment specifically on any one of those and how and, and what the impact is to data management uh, outside of the fact that we take them very seriously uh, and do the uh, impact assessment. Um, I guess the second question then would be, around commissioning, will we get a, a list of those features or, you know, to incorporate into our models? I think the answer is that you're going to get them earlier than commissioning, but certainly commissioning is when you see all of it come together at the same time. Uh, but uh, the, the way that the process works uh, identifies each of them as we go. If we ever accept something that's out of spec or out of our expectation, let's put it that way, um, that, that, that information is immediately available and the way the process runs, it is expected that uh, we have people within the DM team monitoring that channel, uh, so to speak, to make sure that they are already starting to, to engage in those, uh, in any of the activity that's required to, to deal with, a, uh, with that information. So you don't have to wait till commissioning uh, is the bottom line. But Chuck is going to make a comment. Yeah, I'm going to add to this. Um, so that's why we're at, the, at meetings like this, right, is to have these cross-system uh, discussions. But on this particular topic, um, 
we know a lot. We have fairly high fidelity uh, models, so you can either come talk to me, but probably better it would be to come and uh, talk to uh, Bo Jin, who's right back there, who's been doing a lot of the integrated system modeling as these features uh, come to light and um, we tr understand their impact. So uh, you can know now as much as we know. I just want to add one comment just about sort of process. We, we have quite a formal process, actually, of any deviation from spec or from, um, from expectations even. So first off, there is a rigorous acceptance pro process for all components of the telescope and camera. Nothing is accepted uh, you know, that blindly doesn't meet spec without a significant review and assessment of what the impacts are on science, programmatics, et cetera. In addition, there are occasional uh, items that we have chosen to accept that um, are not really in deviation from requirements but have features that were beyond what we were modeling. And in those cases, we file what are called nonconformance reports. So all this is documented, it's tracked by systems engineering. So the, there, aren't, there isn't anything that we know about on received parts that we've just sort of swept on the rug and, fi and we'll leave for later assessments in terms of DM. In cases where we believe that an NCR would require additional functionality in the DM system, we've been in direct connection with DM through the change control process, et cetera, to assess that impact. Hi, so I'm Darren Norman at uh, NOAO, and I wanted to first applaud the project for making communication an important part of uh, what you're focusing on. Um, but I also want to point out that I spend a lot of my time uh, thinking about bias, both uh, scientifically and uh, in other regards. And um, the fact that you know the survey is really only going out to kind of an insider people who already know about LSST community means that you have a real bias in who you're actually sampling from the community. And so I guess I have a little bit of an issue with the idea of using the word community when really, you know, it's, it's really just people who are already engaged in LSST. And I'd like to know more about how the project plans to open things up to a much broader community. Great, thank you for that excellent point, Dara. And we received a comment along these lines this morning as well, and, uh, and it's an excellent point. And uh, you know, advice this morning to us included things such as considering whether we could post the survey on an AAS posting, maybe an NOA occurrence, and if you or anyone else's recommendations on the most appropriate ways for us to push it out to a substantially broader community, we would welcome additional uh, suggestions. Um, you can email them to me, you can bring them up at the breakout. Yeah, you I, can tell me now. I think these kinds of things would actually help in broadening uh, inclusion um, to actually something beyond EPO. I'm sure EPO yeah. is going to do a great job, but I'd like to see some um, research inclusion as well. Great. Thank you very much, Dara. So according to Beth, we have happy hour in our minds. <laughs> you can interpret that any way you want. <laughs> but we are beyond the nominal 5 p.m. closure date for this session. So, oh, there's one more. Mario. Mario, it's Maybe. hard to miss when Mario stands up. <laughs> Maybe this will be a fitting uh, last question. So we've been, over the last couple of weeks, we've been seeing this, this great photograph of the LSST um, nearly built and, and the calibration telescope but I couldn't figure out who was the person who took that photo, and I'd love to give credit where credit is due. Do, do we know who, who that is so we can have them stand up and clap? Uh, yes, we do, and, um, and I think, so there's also a side conversation going on on our, oh, I forgot to say this out loud, to our communications-team at lists.lsst.org uh, about you know, getting some of the most recent photos in the gallery on the public website as well with proper credit. Um, 
I have to remind myself of the name of the person. I, I can give it to you individually, but then also getting it on the gallery with the proper image credits, how we'll solve it. Well, uh, whoever it is, thank you very much. It's a fantastic photo, and I'd just like to clap for the anonymous, still anonymous person. <laughs> Is Patrick in the room? I know Patrick knows the name of the person who contributed it. Patrick originally circulated it. Oh, Jacques. Oh, Jacques knows. I would say again. Great. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, everyone. We're all really excited for the week. And do you guys have to say anything else? Or we're done. We're good. Have a good evening. See you in the morning.